Hi, I'm Omni Sunday. I've been drawing for a long time, and even since before I started, I've always loved making characters. As I've been getting into speculative biology through the past two years since starting college, I've put a lot of thought into the evolution and the anatomy of the non-human characters I've made. So if you'll allow me, this video will just be me nerding out about all the little details of one of my oldest characters. Specifically when it comes to their biology, evolution, and culture, of course. The title isn't clickbait. I'll get into the one specific character in another video which will probably be similar to the making a character video I made a while back. Anyway, let's get into it. We're on an Earth-like planet called Origin, where animals look suspiciously similar to animals on Earth. Nowadays it's in the middle of an ice age, but let's look back into the fossil record 250 million years ago to a land similar to the early Triassic on Earth. The largest land predator of this time was called the Red Crocodile, an animal that looks suspiciously similar to Earth's Erythrosuchus almost like it's the same animal. Anyway, this carnivore had a disproportionately large head, but was 5 meters from snout to tail. Archosaurs are a group of animals that include all the coolest reptiles, crocodiles, pterosaurs, and dinosaurs, the last of which includes birds. On origin, archosaurs are known as dragons, though some look more like dragons than others. Hopefully, the animals I draw in this video will pass enough for dragons that you think they look cool. Here's the final art. The red crocodile was named that because it was first discovered in reddish dirt, but people like to imagine that its scales were red as well. It's technically not a crocodile or an archosaur at all, but it is considered to be closely related to the ancestor of all dragons. It had a large head to swallow prey whole, and could probably run faster than you. 150 million years ago was at the very end of the Jurassic period on Earth. This was a time when birds and sharks evolved, when pterosaurs ruled the sky, and dinosaurs ruled the land. On origin, dinosaurs weren't the only dragons on land. Although this animal is technically more related to crocodiles, it had physical similarities to a theropod dinosaur like Dinochirus. It stood on two legs and had large, lumbering arms with which to attack any competitors. It had a disproportionately large head, with a mane of hair and small, brightly colored horns. Here's the final art. This huge animal was an omnivore, eating plants and animals impartially. It had a thumb-like claw on each hand to do a better job of grabbing branches and other items to bring food closer. It was known as Dracosuchus, or Dragon Crocodile. It wasn't particularly intelligent, but has begun to learn how to manipulate its surroundings with its arms. Traces of its mane have been found in amber, proving that it was a deep black color. On Earth, 50 million years ago was the middle of the Paleogene period. During this time, forests covered most of Earth, and many modern orders of mammals and birds have evolved though notably, non-avian dinosaurs had gone extinct 16 million years earlier. However, no giant meteor had hit origin, so dragons were still very diverse. In a forested island, descendants of the giant dragon crocodiles can be seen climbing and swinging on trees. These animals are still quite large, but surprisingly light. They have long and powerful arms for traversing treetops, and short legs to absorb damage from falls. All adults have horns, but there is some mild sexual dimorphism, with males being larger and having slightly larger horns. Here's the final art. These animals are known as Dracosimians because of their physical similarity to monkeys. The horns might have been useful for combat, but it's likely that they were just for display, as they were covered in keratin and almost certainly brightly colored. Their tails weren't prehensile, but they were flexible and likely great for balance. Dracosimians varied their eating habits depending on what area or season they were in but they seem to have preferred meat. They had comparable intelligence to a baboon, and almost certainly used their arms for object manipulation. It's debated that they might have used tools, but no evidence has been confirmed. Around 25 million years ago on Earth was when apes differentiated from monkeys, and lots of other mammals developed. Again, dragons hadn't gone extinct on origin, so they could continue to evolve. Some Draco simians chose to live on the ground and speck into strength, developing into something similar to a gorilla. These animals were primarily carnivorous and used tools to access their food to the fullest. The females had similar horns to their Dracosimian ancestors, but the males grew huge antler-like keratin-covered horns. They only went extinct a few thousand years ago, so many things about their appearance are known for sure. Here's the final art. While all males had relatively large horns, certain males grew larger than the rest and had extra colors on their horns. Stories from when these animals were alive tell of the magical power of the females. That no matter what, every vertebrate had something compelling them not to look into the eyes of these dragons. That no matter how much you wanted to look, 
you would close your eyes or turn your head to avoid looking into the eyes of the females. This sounds far-fetched, but this quality perseveres in female descendants of these animals today. Scientists still aren't sure how this mechanism works, but pictures from cameras and testimony from non-vertebrate sapient species show that the eyes of the females look no different from the eyes of other members of their species. And because magic is cool and laser beams are cool, I decided that these dragons and their descendants can also shoot laser beams from their mouth. This won't affect their evolution much, so if you're not into magic, don't worry about it. I just wanted to draw it because who doesn't like dragons shooting laser beams from their mouth? Anyway, around 10 million years ago on Earth was when chimpanzees and humans started to diverge, and it was also when the Earth started to cool towards a series of ice ages. Origin was also starting to cool, but it was still much warmer than it is today. The forested island that these dragons had evolved on was running out of food, so these dragon apes began to hunt in the water. Their huge arms that were built for climbing trees and combat on the ground also happened to be great for swimming. Their legs grew longer, and they lost most of their hair as well. Eventually, a species differentiated that lived most of its life on water, though it was certainly capable of surviving on land as well. They had long curly hair on the top of their heads to avoid damage from the sun. Their horns shrank a bit, along with their general body size, probably due to the, all the energy it takes to keep a huge body like that constantly swimming. You'd think that horns are bad for swimming due to how much it worsens aerodynamics, but these animals seem to have kept them because of how innate they've been in selection for millions of years. Here's the final art. These Draco Kappas were incredibly intelligent, comparable to early humans. Their dimorphism in this species is quite noticeable, with females being smaller but lacking lips. The theory is that females did most of the hunting, and their lack of lips allowed food to spill so other members of the species could eat. This seems like a stretch, but no living specimens have been found in a thousand years, so it's hard to say anything for sure. It could just be a coincidence, and something happened to the two well-preserved female specimens that would just make them look this way. I'm just here to tell you the theories. One group of these animals stayed around the islands north of the equator, and another lived closer to the southern continent. They were also capable of underwater laser beams, because that's cool and awesome. Around 5 million years ago, the terrestrial ecosystems restabilized, and Draco Kappas were able to return to land. There were two separate populations, the island people and the mainland people. The genus of these animals is called Yoshis, because their design may have been inspired by a certain video game character when I was a child. It's not really noticeable at this point, but the legacy remains. Anyway, they eventually lost the webbing on their hands, but the webbing on their feet thickened to walk better. Most of the time they walked upright, so using their hands for tools was very easy. However, to run, they galloped on all fours, reaching impressive speeds. This is why their proportions are different from most humans. They continued to use their arms extensively throughout millions of years and depended on their strength for survival. This is the final art. Their species name is Lenta, which means slow in Greek, but also means tough in Latin. The mainland people hunted using weapons and tools, but the island people hunted more traditionally by chasing them down and taking them out with a fatal bite. Both prepared their food using fire and tools and had similar intelligence, but the mainland people considered themselves to be more civilized. As time passed, the mainland people grew an agricultural civilization, while the islanders were a seafaring people. Both developed relatively advanced technology, but the islanders were limited to wood and stone while the mainland people had metals like bronze and iron. Neither, however, were explorers. These dragons were able to dominate other life forms for two main reasons. Though their lifespans weren't particularly long, they only began to age 5-10 to 10 years before their death. So, even if they die of old age at 50 years old, they will be in their prime from their early 30s to the late 40s, and before reaching their prime they are still very strong and capable of fighting. They also had a raw form of magic that characterizes itself by powerful energy attacks, meaning they could often overpower other magic users without practice. These two traits allowed them to form massive armies without much training. This species also has a high amount of dimorphism, with females not only being smaller, but also having that weird magic things with the eyes and all that. The females also had significantly longer lifespans, as they didn't have to power such massive bodies like the males did. The females had to cover their eyes at an early age, but also learned to see magic without their eyes, and with that, they were able to lead the civilization towards higher technology and better living standards with magic. Back to the story, eventually, the war-loving continental dragons attacked the peaceful islanders, driving the latter into the icy northern continent. By this time, Origin looks similar to how it looks today, but maybe a bit less icy. 
we can mostly focus on the western hemisphere for this video, meaning the left half of the map. Note the three islands somewhat north of the equator, the icy north continent, and the slightly less icy south continent. The south continent connects back into the right side of the map because the idiots who made this map set the longitude to start in their capital city as opposed to somewhere more convenient. Anyway, also note the desert to the west of the southern continent. That will be important later as the oasis was a bit smaller, so the sandy desert stretched for hundreds of kilometers. The northern continent is divided by a mountain range, so you'd have to go up and around to get to the somewhat habitable tundra. From now on, I'll refer to the islanders as red dragons, and the mainlanders as blue dragons. After being forced out of the islands, the remaining red dragons had to survive the cold north, and even fewer remained by the time they reached the tundra. They crossed paths with a few other sapient species on their way, but these peaceful giants were able to trade knowledge to get through the harsh environment. They were able to acquire warm clothes, and develop their own culture by combining the others in the area. It was around this time that the red dragons evolved male pattern baldness, and to this day they are the only animals on origin other than humans to develop this. The reasons why are still unknown. Here's the final art. Their species is called Yoshis Lenta, with the subspecies title of Lenta. So Yoshis Lenta Lenta. Kinda like how grey wolves are Canis Lupus Lupus. Biologically, the red dragons are distinct from their ancestors in a few ways. For one, they're significantly heavier. Males often grow more than two and a quarter meters and can weigh upwards of 150 kilograms. That's almost 700 Big Macs in weight. They have large fat stores that can store energy while also keeping warm, and their red horns release heat to keep children warm. They have the most drastic dimorphism of their kind, with females weighing less than two thirds of the males. Culturally, they had lineages of kings that would lead them. These kings had impressive horns with markings reminiscent of eyes on the face of a dragon. Throughout the generations, the stories about blue dragons turned from stories of fear to stories of anger. The red dragons conquered the north, though their conquest was somewhat different. Instead of trying to kill the other civilizations, the red dragons simply made them work and pay taxes. Whether this is better or worse is up to your own opinion to decide, but it was ingrained in their culture not to make the same mistakes as the blue dragons did because the mistakes of the blue dragons will come back to them. Speaking of blue dragons, they didn't just stop evolving. The abundance of wealth and food they had allowed them to grow to larger sizes, as well as have longer lifespans and more powerful magic. Their blue horns absorbed energy, so they could use it for increasingly impressive magic. To this day, the subspecies is considered the most powerful life form to ever live on origin. They were strong enough alone could fell the most powerful deities in groups. The blue dragons conquered every corner of the southern continent and the three islands above. Here's the final art. This subspecies is scientifically known as Yoshis Lenta Rex to signify their world-bending power. You might notice something though. This species went extinct 10,000 years ago. What could possibly have led to the extinction of such a powerful animal? For one, although they could live up to 300 years, they reached maturity at the age of 40, and an individual usually only laid eggs once a century. This meant that their population size was relatively small despite their unchallenged hold on origin. Another problem was in their culture. Although they had a, by Earth standards, modern form of democratic republic, which modern origin has yet to adopt, there was one fatal flaw. Instead of locking criminals, blue dragons, in jail cells like they did everyone else, they held fellow blue dragons to a higher standard, exiling criminals to the desert, which they thought would lead to certain death. This was where they were wrong. By surveying the perimeter of the desert, they assumed that this huge desert was sandy and barren all the way through. However, most of those who were exiled found themselves in a new society of dragons distinct from those outside the desert. The blue dragons started this practice of exiling more than 100,000 years ago, so over time the exiled ones differentiated in more ways than one. To start, desert life isn't easy. Even though it isn't as barren as the blue dragons thought, these exiled dragons still had to deal with constant sandstorms and water loss. They quickly evolved shorter lifespans and smaller sizes, simply because those things could no longer be sustained. They weren't as educated or technologically advanced as their ancestors, and thus their blue energy absorbing horns became a hindrance. Slowly, they evolved a greener color to reflect more light and evolve towards water storage. Their hair became straight and dark to better deal with the sun and constant sandstorms, 
and they were much lighter to it than their ancestors. Here's the final art. This subspecies is called Yoshis lenta velux. Velux means fast in Latin, referring to how fast and sudden their evolution was, and also their lifespan and metabolism compared to their blue light ancestors. Informally, they're called the green dragons. Their dimorphism is much less drastic than the other subspecies, and due to the faster maturation and longer lifespan of females, their culture was actually matriarchal. The females go through an odd process where they lose their lips around their late teenage years only to gain them back in their late 20s. It's suspected that this evolved for intimidation purposes, but it's not really known for sure. This subspecies lost the powerful secrets of magic that their blue ancestors had, and they were not only smaller, but also weaker. So how did they cause the extinction of Yoshis Lenta Rex? Here's the map of origin again. Notice the desert in the southwest. Notice how unbelievably huge this desert is compared to the rest of the southern continent. In less than 100,000 years, there were more than 20 green dragons for every blue dragon. Even if they were weaker than their ancestors, they weren't that much weaker. 10,000 years ago, a warlord by the name of Terra collected a huge number of troops to finally execute an attack on the outside of the desert. His troops quickly decimated the blue dragon population, and their government's retaliation was too little too late. From there, the green dragons quickly became the dominant species in the southern continent and the islands above. Any remaining blue dragons either died or joined the green dragons, like Neanderthals on Earth. But that's not the end of this story. Let's go back to the map of origin. By this time, the red dragons were comfy in the cold north, which is quite the huge plot of land despite its harsh environment. Was this their time for revenge? With blue dragons out of the picture, the power of the northern species was looking much more oppressive. And with the previous war being only a few decades before, the green dragons were still recovering from their conquest. A red king by the name of Mendelgard saw this as his chance to gain legitimacy as the one to reign justice on those who took the territory of his ancestors. If the last war was an easy win for the green dragons, this war was like taking candy from a baby for the red dragons. Long story short, save for the eastern continent, all of origin was under the rule of the Mendelgard king. This was mostly because the dragons didn't know the eastern continent existed. So what's origin like now? Well, until about 100 years ago, it was surprisingly unchanged. Every Sabian species was allowed to live mostly as they wished, but under the superiority of the Mendelgard throne. While the red dragons saw the green dragons as no different from any other lowly species, the others saw green dragons as a symbol of hope. Green dragons represented a powerful group of people that stood up for those who were oppressed. And although green dragons had no representation in the monarchy, they were always stopping the red dragons from overstepping their abuse of power. This started to change a hundred years ago, when many non-royal red dragons began to see the error of their ways and accepted green dragons as a member of their species. From there, they began to call for a change in the way the law treats non-red dragons. This culminated 80 years ago in a chair of rulers representing each species, with the dragon king being the head of the chair. Could be better, but many people were happy with the change and saw it as a big step in the right direction. Then, 30 years ago, an event happened that would change history. Louis Mendelgard, the latest in a 10,000 year long line of the Red Dragon Kings, married Sarah Terra, the latest in a similarly long line of Green Dragon Chiefs. 13 years ago, their son Louis Mendelgard was coronated, making history once again. This Mendelgard king is the current ruler of Western origin, and he is known as the Good King for his various steps forward he's made in sapient rights, and his charming personality. He gave up much of his power to allow for other civilizations to have more freedom, and has used much of his power to improve the living conditions of those in poverty. Even those who think he's a softy or otherwise disagree with his politics have no choice but to respect him for his character, hence the Good King. Well, that's about it. This is by far the longest script I've written. It's almost six pages long, and it's almost 3,700 words. Jeez, what am I doing with my life? I hope y'all enjoyed this, because I certainly enjoyed making it, and I'm definitely making more whether y'all like it or not. Though I'd still love to hear any constructive criticism from those of you who made it this far on how to make it better. My next Spec Evo video will probably be much shorter and less deep than this one. It'll be about horseflies. Hope to see you again, and thanks for watching!